How do you build a network, run a profitable business, and make an impact, oh, and have a personal life at the same time? That's the question, and this podcast is the answer. I'm your host, Chaz Wilson, husband, father of five, author of the book, Five Plus One, president and co-founder of Master Networks, Inc., a national networking organization. Look, each week I bring you successful entrepreneurs who will share success strategies of how to effectively build a network, add valuable wisdom to your journey, and help you succeed. Welcome to Connect, Share, and Prosper. All right, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Connect, Share, Prosper. Uh, I'm. This is like a much anticipated call. Very excited today to do this podcast. If you're if you're listening uh, on YouTube or Facebook, um, listen. Make sure you subscribe so you get notified every time these come out. And I'm honored today to have a business mentor and friend, uh, author of several best-selling books. I could go through the list that your, 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 um, your, uh, your biography bio is so long with all the accomplishments, Dave, and so many of our members know you, love oh, you, you and get, support you. Hey, Jazz, when you get old, you have a long bio. <laughs> no, well, listen, I love it. So welcome Dave Jenks to the Connect Share Prosper podcast. Thank you, Chaz. Great to be here, my friend. Yeah, so glad to have you here. And so, listen, I want to jump right in to this. Yeah, let's, let's go it. back to 2013, I believe, if I have my year correct. Uh, I sent you an email. Um, 2012, actually. Two, the 2012, fall, the fall of 2012. Fall of 2012, yeah. Yeah, so I sent right. you an email. Uh, right. For those of you who understand Master Networks and the Bond Method, we talked about how I've used the Bond Method to connect with Dave. So I knew you. Uh, I knew of you, I should say. I knew of you. Right. From Keller Williams. From Keller Williams. Right. Both had a Board real estate there. background. And I reached out to you, and this is what I love. You guys, right away, I want you to take this note if you're listening to this. Obviously, if you're driving listening to this, wait till you get back. But write this down. Dave said to me, set expectations of our first phone call. I don't know if you remember this. You said, I'll give you 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. And we had a 15-minute call. It turned into 45 minutes. We just kept going. But you right, right. you got to drive that. Calls always do. That's yeah. right. And so, Dave, you then said, listen, I'm coming out to Minnesota, which was where we were, we were headquartered because you have a family there. You have a son that lives there. And he said, I, you said, I want to spend some time with you to get this idea fleshed out. So here's what I'd like to ask you right from the beginning. Yes. What was interesting to you about this idea of Master Networks right from the beginning? From your perspective, what was, what was interesting to you? First thing was your energy. And I would just tell you, that's the one thing about connecting with people. If you connect with them with energy, you also paid me a compliment of the uh, impact I'd had on your thinking and career and why you were reaching out to me. All of those are, all of those are important because they're the emotional end of, uh, of, of the networking discipline, right? Of, of really connecting with people is, is, is building that rapport at the front end. And you did that so sincerely and so directly. So one is that made me feel good about you. Number two was I could tell that you uh, and and your partner had really been thinking about a really creative um, idea. And I Mm. love creative ideas. And because I had founded Free Enterprise Warriors after I left my career with a series of of, uh, real estate franchise systems and had begun my own work with uh, uh, guiding and teaching entrepreneurs, your, your mission just right away struck me now. What I really got was that you wanted to take Master Networks and make it a place where entrepreneurs could get education, stimulation, and support toward the achievement of their goals. See, and as I looked around the industry, uh, all of entrepreneurship, that's mostly what they need, and there's no place that they can go to get it. And to me, that's what you were, that's what Master Networks was going to provide a place for them to get what they most need. It was, was interesting you brought this up, Free Enterprise Warriors. So you have this fantastic real estate career, which we'll talk about in a minute. You have this fantastic real estate career. You're, you, uh, you know, you're, you're no longer in the real estate industry uh, at that time. And you started this venture, Free Enterprise Warriors, which, which I, at the time I didn't really know much about what you were doing. So it was like this perfect storm. But tell us about what drove you to want to work with at that point, you broadened your horizon to, you, in, in the sense of leaving the real estate industry to work with all entrepreneurs of every industry. What was it about entrepreneurs that you love that attracts you to the business world of, the, of entrepreneurs? I love the idea of ownership. I love the idea of, first of all, that you own what you do, that you want to go and create results. One of the reasons I think I left higher education where I had a career, I'd been an executive in uh, several, two really major universities. 
I had helped uh, in their fundraising and communication programs. And what I really found was that the academic environment tends not to really reward uh, achievement, mm -hmm. real hands-on pragmatic achievement. It, it, it loves to play with ideas. And yeah, theory. right. And I love, I've always in my love, lo life loved pragmatic things where you can get things done. So right away, once I got open to the world of business and entrepreneurship, I got attracted to it. And then the more I looked at it, the more I really loved people who in, were in business for themselves, say, as opposed to corporate America. Corporate America has its own set of rules and its own procedures and its ways to succeed, right? And yes. obviously, a lot of corporations began as entrepreneurial ventures in the garage or whatever. It right. Big. So anyway, I really, I, I really, Chaz was attracted to the idea of people being in business for themselves. And then when I got connected to the real estate industry, which was done through a networking opportunity by a good friend of mine who came and was a student of mine in the Dale Carnegie sales course said, Dave, what are you going to do after you get your doctorate? And I said, I'm looking for a company where I can train salespeople and leaders. And he said, whoa, we have those in the company I'm with. And I knew he was with Century 21. He said, let me go. Oh, you would be great with us. Let me connect you with you. And that, so that connection, Chaz, really just started my whole career. What's interesting uh, for people who know that I'm an expert in real estate, I've written the best, co-authored the best-selling yes. books. I've, other than my own properties, I've never sold a house. I've never helped wow. someone buy or sell a house. I've never been in real estate. But what, and this is important for people to understand. But what I am is a student of the game. Mm. And when I understood the game of real estate, I mean, how to play it at a high level, both as an agent and as an owner of a franchise, then uh, I really enjoyed uh, helping people do that. Well, it's fascinating. So it's still the one, if not the best selling real estate book still, right? Yeah, um, what, still what, yeah, what year was that? 2000? Came out in 2003. Four, three, and yep. it was republished uh, under, because we had to self-publish it. No one yep. wanted to publish it yep. until they saw how successful we were on Amazon. And so then uh, McGraw-Hill came by and asked us if they could republish it under their brand. And we did. That was 2004. But yeah, it's been that long, 15 years. You know, 15 I mean, years. it's so, uh, number one, just to write a book, get somebody to buy it. But to be number one this many years is shows the wisdom of that book. But what I, I found fascinating, I want to go back to something. So Dale Carnegie training. Yes. Is that really the first place you started to build a foundation for training and that kind of, I mean, there's the academic stuff, obviously you go to school and all that, but like outside of that, was that kind of one of the first places you started? Well, it really was in terms of, of a business orientation, right? I mean, yeah. as you said, I'd been in academe. Uh, I had actually trained to be a high school science and math teacher originally before mm -hmm. I got into the world of higher education and really enjoyed that. Uh, but yes, the, the, okay, in fact, I, I took it because I think a lot of us who are learning based in life, uh, when we don't know how to do something, we, we say, where can I learn to do that? So I didn't know how to sell. Here I was VP of sales and marketing of a graphic arts company, printing yeah. company in Albany, New York. And I, I had never really, I mean, sold anything that I would call selling. And so a friend of mine said, you know, you really ought to go to the Dale Carnegie sales course. They have several courses, but one is for salespeople. Well, I went to that and I ended up becoming an instructor of it because I think I just inherently love to teach. Yes. Uh, but that, you're right, Jess, that was a foundation in understanding that selling is a profession. Yep. That selling has a set of steps you go through in building rapport with someone who you are trying to guide down the path to say yes to doing business with you. And that really opened me up to the world of, of, of selling, of business, and marketing. So would you consider yourself a salesperson? Yes, I am. I'm, a, I'm an influencer. Yeah. I'm a marketeer. Uh, in some ways, I may be more of a marketeer because I've tended to promote big ventures like Master Networks or Keller Williams or Century 21. There's something about me that likes to be involved at the high end of the implementation of a powerful idea. Mm. So in a sense... You know, it slides over more to marketing in that I'm not doing face to face. Hey, you know, what are your needs? And look at my product. And are you, yep. you know, are you interested in taking them down that that sales path? But what you and I know is that underneath every entrepreneur must be the skill of selling. Sometimes it shows up as marketing, the way we put ourselves out to the world through our materials or our Facebook or our social media or any advertising but also the way we interact with people in that we can sell the benefits of what we do. So we know all, all entrepreneurs must master the art of selling. 
I, so I couldn't agree more about the art of selling as a skill. In fact, I'd probably put it as one of the top three skills an entrepreneur, I think it is. right? So, yes. And yet sales has such a negative connotation in so many uh, circles or so many circumstances yeah. or phrases. And yet, so, so here on one end, you've got sales as this negative thing that often comes up and yet, or, or seems negative, but it's not. And like sales is such an important skill. And so like, how does, how does one become a better salesperson in your opinion of the, the, and you've worked around some great salespeople I have, and, and I have absolutely right. So what would you say helps somebody become a, that they could do right now to improve their sales skills? Attitude of service, uh, seriously wanting to connect with other people, build great relationships mm. and in the end, help them change or clarify their thinking. Right. So the reason we have this bad impression of salespeople is because we have the old, you know, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Right. Right. Uh, uh, salespeople make it. You, know, you got to be a closer. You got to be a closer. And Coffee's for closers, closer. right? The the phrase. Coffee's for closers. <laughs> right. You manipulate people. You kind of you maybe mislead them. Mm. It's kind of full of cleverness and cunning. Well, that's the old. But see, the thing is, what you learn in the world of business is great salespeople are great service providers. They passionately believe in their product. Uh, they are great relationship builders. And then they are very good at helping people, guiding them through their thought process to see why this product or service would be beneficial to them. So to me, it's the same way, Chaz, yeah. in which a lot of people misunderstand people who are in business for themselves. They think business mm. owners are greedy. Mm. Well, no, business owners are the most service-oriented people in the world because they have to be. Yeah. If you don't provide a service that someone not just wants but is willing to pay for, they're not going to be in business. So great selling is great service. So it kind of made me think of something and I, I don't even know exactly how to ask, ask the question, but I know that a lot of the people listening and if guys, if you're just tuning in, I'm with Dave Jenks, uh, Dean of master networks university and a uh, great friend of this show and of myself and my family. And I'm just uh, honored to have you on the show. But Dave, let me, let me ask the question about this. I know so many of our members and people listening struggle with one thing when it comes to selling and being in business for themselves. And that is what to charge, especially if they have control over the pricing of their product or service. Because I find that most people struggle with, they undervalue somewhat of what they do. And so how does one overcome that? Like how do, how do you get help in that arena to know what to charge and, and what's the right price? And should I increase it? Should I not? Like that kind of thing. Do you have any thoughts on that? I do. And it's a matter of who your target market is. It's what you, you wrote in, uh, in 5 plus 1, the yeah. second discipline. Second discipline is targeting. You, you've got to find the right audience. A lot mm. of people begin by approaching an audience that wants things cheap. See, everyone wants things, everyone in general wants things cheap and easy and fast. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's all of our natures. So you as an as a entrepreneur and a salesperson and a marketeer, have to have to increase the perception of the value of your service mm. now once mm. and the, you know the first person you have to sell is yourself yes because i find a lot of entrepreneurs are actually not very confident about the value of what they do they they go well you know maybe i'm charging too much or who would want to be able to pay for this or a lot of people i talk to just can't afford it well maybe you're talking to the wrong people so, because the, you, what you want are the ones who can. So you, you and I know we've said it. It's it's able, ready, and willing, right? Mm -hmm. and it's, not, it's not ready, willing, and able. It's able, able ready, willing. and willing. Able, yeah. they can afford what your product is. Yep. Two is uh, ready. They need it. They yep. really need. It. And willing is they trust you and they want you to provide it, right? Yes. So yeah. you go down that track with people. And why you are always talking to people about going out and networking is because you're trying to find the people that one, need your service, yep. two, are willing to pay for it, and three, really value the way you offer it. Yeah. Now, the better you get at that, at articulating your message and believing in your message and finding people that need it, then the more they will lead you to other people. Now you start to say, okay, what is it that I can that I can charge that will that, that will will not get in the way of them saying yes yes right, right. in other words it won't get in the way it's yep. not over and and sometimes when you cheapen your price it gets in the way yeah because they go oh really yeah okay you know the other thing you have to be aware of in the in any world of business is 
your competition. Free enterprise is competition. Yes. So yeah. you have to go out and say, for similar services that I'm providing, what are others charging? Because you're going to be compared to that in your buyer's minds to some degree, some way. Now, yes, right. then you make the strategy, Chaz, do I want to be the low end? Do I want to be the deal? Yep. The really get good stuff for not much money? Yep. Do I want to be in the middle of that pack or do I want to be the exclusive high end? Yes, I charge. I had once had a real estate agent out of San Antonio. She was wonderful. The first thing she would say to sellers, she'd say, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, by the way, I just want you to know right up front, I charge 1% more to sell your home than the average agent in my market. Oh, I love it. And I just want you to know, I know I'm worth it. And the people who work with me know I'm worth it. But I want you to know in case there's any other comparisons you're doing that I do charge more. Wow, how'd that work? That I mean, amazing? what was the oh, response? It's amazing. No, she was she was at the top of the market. She was yeah. one of the top maybe three to five salespeople out of three thousand in uh, in San Antonio. So it wasn't a it wasn't a script per se. It was she believed it. I mean, it, there was an obviously an inherent belief for her to have the confidence to well, say that well, right out well, of the gate. She game. would say, and and by the way, do you have any questions? And they say, well, I mean, what do you do that makes you right. worth more? And, and bam, she just run the list. I do this. I do this. I do this. I do this. I get back to you this way. I give yeah, you yeah. this. Product. I do these checking. I, I protect your interests all the way to the closing. Other agents don't do that. You know, I, I, just, I don't just price it right. I stage it right. That'll add value to your home right away. Anyway, she, she had the list of benefits. And that's the other thing about salespeople. Yeah. And you really, entrepreneurs really need to work to make the list of benefits of the way they do business and the service they provide. Because some of it is the actual service and what that does for the consumer. But the other is what it feels like to work with you. The commitment you're yeah. making for communication, the commitment you're making for getting back. Uh, one of the reasons I love working with Amazon, they're, they're a, obviously a marketing powerhouse, right. is that they think it's so easy to turn uh, return products that you don't like. Yes. Well, wow. You would think, well, is that really a benefit? Oh, my God, that makes me so secure in buying things from them because I know I can return them. So you, sometimes what you're doing is taking anything that feels scary in the purchase moment for your for your buyer uh you're trying to take that away so they don't have to worry about that yeah so i've once heard it said in, about amazon such a good point so um they do a really good job of putting friction in the right place and removing friction in the right place meaning a, absolutely they've right. removed the friction of purchasing right like one button you can save all your your profiles and your cards and your address and boom 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 it's done like a one-click purchase on the product so they remove the friction it's so easy and then on other places, they put friction where it needs to be, but they, they're a product and service that just removes that friction in so many places. Everywhere. I think that yeah. one of the things that's interesting uh, about him, uh, about Jeff Bezos, and yeah. I think there's probably a two, other, uh, two or three others I would think of in that category, uh, like Sam Walton, where they all say it's the customer experience. Yes. Uh, yeah, he yep. said at the beginning, I don't care if we're making money. I mean, we're going to be efficient. We're not yeah, going to waste right, money, right? But but what I care about is the consumer experience, and right. I want feedback on that, and I want to pay attention to that feedback, and I want customer satisfaction. And if I build customer satisfaction, then right. I know I'm right. going to get market share, and when I get market share, I'm going to get profit. Well, I would say for a lot of entrepreneurs, that's the same thing. They should really be checking on the satisfaction. Then when yep. they have people who love the service they're providing then they become your testimonials. They become your advocates. So let's talk about that because you've had the experience and you talked about this and before you've referred to it with me as an intrapreneur, right? This entrepreneurial minded uh, activities and, and the way that you approach it, but you're in potentially, you're in somebody else's venture, their, their business. Uh, maybe you're a partner, maybe you're not um, working with them to grow it. And you've had those experiences. Yeah, that's been more my role. I really realized even though I have served entrepreneurs and I love entrepreneurship, I am more of an entrepreneur. Even with you, Chaz, I, yeah. I team up with you. Yeah. I teamed up with you at the beginning and we built things and I was, you know, and I felt like I owned it, right? I, yeah, mean, yeah. I felt like right. I was part of it with you, but really you owned it and you were the driver of it. And the same thing has been true for me with other companies. Now, what I think that entrepreneurs then are looking for to surround themselves is with entrepreneurs. I mm. want someone who owns the outcome, who always isn't always looking for someone else to give them direction. They own it, and they take responsibility for. Oh, I screwed that up. It was my fault. I did that. Mm. You know, they own whatever happens, and they and they desire the outcome, but that they uh, but they may not be the one that's the driving visionary because yep. that's a smaller group of people that care enough about a particular vision that they drive it. 
Mm, so let's talk about that for a second. The people you've worked with, and I, I'm not looking for specifics or particulars of anyone, but um, so when we got a few questions ahead of time, and I'm going to shorten the kind of context of it to just get to okay. the point of it. One of the things that came up is like, as an entrepreneur, because some people we have in Master Networks or who listen to this, they don't own the venture they're in. This is why I think you're, okay. you being on this show is such a good thing because a lot of the people that we've talked with, you know, they're running their own company and so they don't have that perspective of it. So I'd love to hear yours. And, and one of the questions was about, so you're sit, let, let's just set a stage. You're sitting in an executive meeting with the founders, maybe other executives. I'm sure you've had those meetings and you're brainstorming ideas and you're coming up. So two, two, two things happen. Maybe you present an idea or you present something that doesn't get the steam you want or the, you know, you're like, this is the idea. I know it's going to be working. And whoever, whether it's a boss, a manager, a CEO, whoever's in front of you, if you will, who's going to make that final decision doesn't agree with it, right? Number right. one, how, how do you deal with that as somebody who's an entrepreneur? And then how do you, how do you um, continue to support a business and how do you really add value as an entrepreneur? So kind of two things there, but that was the long question I tried to give more context to. You know, I, get, I, get, I get both parts of that, really. And I think that actually the second part maybe really leads to the first, and that is that, that you say, what can I do to make this venture more successful? Uh, what can I do as it is, right? How can I act within the current framework, the current design? How can I be passionate about this? and do it well so that the owners begin to build, let's say the ones that are the entrepreneurs, they yeah. begin to build a sense of trust about me. I'm not trying to change their business, I'm trying to get their business implemented. Mm. I'm trying to get the outcomes they want. And then my reports back to them are always about the outcomes. Look how many sales we made, or look how look at the customer satisfaction you know, numbers we're getting back, yeah. or the reports, or the advocates, and look at how our database has grown, and. Look at how our productivity has improved. Look at, you yeah. know, uh, service service time on the job. Look at his drop down by 20%. You know, anything that you're in charge of, you're always feeding back to the ones who care, the founders, yep. the, the yep. entrepreneur. Yep. You're always feeding back to them that information that is beneficial to them. you got to be honest, though, about it. If it's not, if the numbers aren't going right, you got to say, okay, we've got a problem. The numbers are going not the right way. Yes. Here's what I think we can do about that. So you have to be honest about it, but you still always are, are thinking like, what do they want to know and what do they want to see happen? Now, the second part of, or really the first part of that question is whenever there's an idea um, fest going on, you're in a sales environment. So if mm. you're wanting to put an idea on the table, then you better sell it. Yes. And the selling of it better be in their ears. They have to hear the benefit they want to get not just because you think it's cute or different or whatever. So you really have to be saying, okay, um, all right, I'm, I'm not feeling that, that this idea, so let me, let me scope it out a little further. And at our next meeting, let me come back with a little more of a sense of why I think this idea is going to benefit the company. Right? It's always that. Yeah. It's yeah. going to benefit the company. Well, one of the things I think that you've done such a great job, and then I'm going to ask you a kind of a follow-up question to that is, and I learned this great lesson from you is that like when you get in those meetings too, and, and, and sometimes in my past early on in business, you know, there were meeting like meetings like that. And it was like this big ego thing, like whose idea was going to win, you know? And I think that that's, you got to put that aside and go, what's the best for this, the organization, the company, or the outcome we're trying to achieve. And you've always done such a great job of setting that stage anytime we've ever been in a meeting. So now I want to ask you a different question, but in the same context, I would love to hear a story from you of any time where, like what's been the greatest lesson you've learned, especially in a context like that, like in a meeting around, I just know you've worked with some great business people in your, in your history, whether it be local, uh, big companies, small companies, whatever. Like what's the greatest lesson if you look back over your career that you've learned in your interactions with people in business? Listen, listen more. You know, there's such a, a kind of desire in the world of business to sort of be assertive and to assert your ideas. And sometimes I've asserted my ideas with too much enthusiasm. I mean, mm -hmm. too much physical, emotional energy. And right away, for some people, that just turns them off if they're a little more rational or they're a little more measured. And you're coming on, you know, you know with strong. Right. You know, they, they, oh, you, can, you can see the door shut, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what you do is, it's like in any selling, you put out something provocative. You know, you say, well, I mean, what would it mean um, if our, if our uh, field leaders, say in, in Keller Williams, if our field leaders 
really understood why the um, millionaire real estate agent is a tool they can use mm. to attract better agents to their business. Okay, what would it what would it be? Well, it'd be great. It would be great. Okay, then I think we should go out with a program to the regions and to the market centers about how to use the millionaire real estate agent as a recruiting tool and then tie it to their education. See, and then all of a sudden, oh, okay, okay. Now I yeah, see, yeah. right? I see the benefit we're going to get. Same thing, Chaz, with, you know, with what we're doing uh, with the, the, the leaders of Master Networks. Yes. They're saying, look, we've got the best book ever written about building a local business, an on, a truly entrepreneurial business. It's called Five Plus One. That book should help us build our chapters. It should help us with, with our members within the chapters, build mm. their business. They ought to be really excited about sharing with each other the ideas they've implemented. And of course, that will cause us to grow. Yeah. And of course, that's the, in any company, growth is the fundamental measure, uh, particularly in a national company, uh, of of the success of what you're doing. You're yeah, growing. love it. So guys, if you're joining again, listening, I'm with Dave Jenks, Dean of Master Networks University. We're talking sale, we're talking business and sales, which I, you know, of course I'm passionate about. So Dave, I wanna know something, we're gonna shift this completely. I wanna know something sure. interesting. What, is there something about you that most people don't know about Dave Jenks? Like what's a, a hobby, uh, uh, an interest, something that nobody knows really about, maybe a few people, but what do most people not know about Dave Jenks? Well, the funny thing is that uh, you know that at the at the age of let me get this right, uh, sixty seven or sixty eight, yeah. I, I took up mountain biking. Yeah. Right. That and that I actually up in Sedona, Arizona, which is one of the mountain biking capitals of the country, with all these red rock uh, trails and single track trails, and some of them are just you know death defying. So I don't, yeah. I don't do those or I. I hike and bike, right? I mean, I, I hike the bike over the bad place and then go the others. But And that I then competed in what's called the Leadville 100 uh, in 2012 at the age of 70. I went in and I was a competitor, 1,500 other bikers leaving wow. Leadville and traveling 105 miles over single track and incredibly competitive and, you know, world-class people. I mean, world-class bikers. Uh, and I got to do that. So that was that was fun. And I think the other thing is that that, that I'm a real science fiction freak. I just, my favorite reading is a great science fiction book. Uh, and there's a series of them out now by a fellow by the name of, of uh, uh, Douglas Richards, uh, who does what's called near-term science fiction. So he takes things that are really happening now, like increases in intelligence through, through pills or through you know, exercises yeah. uh, or, or artificial intelligence and where can that go? And then he, he builds a story out maybe 25 or 30 years of where this might go. And it's just fascinating. He, he writes a good story too, right? There's always yeah. a lot of intrigue and suspense, yeah. but it's, it's, it's this contemplation. And I think that's kind of fundamentally, Chaz, why I, I am a futurist. Yeah. I love when you, when you came to the idea about creating a new business to business referral network of chapters and I'd been around that and I knew of that, but then I saw you had a new vision for it, that it really would be, a, that it would be an educational arm, that people would really learn how to be better entrepreneurs. Yeah. See, then I got very excited about it because I could see the future of it. This is where the future needs to go. That's what I found with Keller Williams. And when I joined Keller Williams, a lot of people don't understand because now with 175,000 agents worldwide, it's 50,000 agents bigger than any other real estate company in wow. the world. Wow, and, and and you know, and it, it got there in let's say twenty years. Yeah, I joined it twenty years ago, and we had only about eighteen hundred agents, mostly in Texas and Oklahoma, and a few other outlying places, but not much. And now it's you know now it it's the dominant player in the industry, and you kind of ask yourself, you know, how does that happen? Yeah. Well, it happens because you decide how is it this business really works. And then you get the right models and systems, just like Master Networks yep. does for entrepreneurs, that really make it grow. And that's exciting when you take an idea and it goes that big. So you joined it at 1,800 agents 20 years ago. Yep. I mean, it's easy, I think, in retrospect to say, yeah, we knew it was going to be this big. But did you did you really know at that point? Or did no, you have doubts? No. Did you? How did you overcome that? No, no, there's no, we didn't have doubts. What we had were aspirations. And I think... Yeah. Uh, that you always have aspirations and you don't know how big you can take it. You let time and performance 
tell you how big it'll go. Just don't put any caps on it, right? Oh, I think we'd be really good if we were around 5,000 agents. Don't do that. That's putting a top on it. Yeah. Just say, what do we need to do to get to our next level? Right now, one thing we said, because we believe that good businesses always run on profitability. It uh, doesn't mean the profit's the, the, end, the only end result. Right. Uh, it's not the purpose, you know, a profit isn't. There's some other purpose you serve, but we just felt that, pro so we, Gary Keller and I said together, we want to build one profitable market center at a time. Just like you would say, we want one master chapter at a time. Correct. We want one master chapter with an ROI of 400 or 500,000 a year at a time, yep. right? Now that doesn't slow you down. I mean, that doesn't slow you right. down because you can do a lot of them, but you always want to make sure that the ones you're building are great. So we took that as the vision. And then we said, what would we need to do in the real estate industry in order to create that company that would become the one agents wanted to be with and the one that was solid and well-managed and profitable. Yeah. And that's what we did. Now the growth then began, began that momentum. And as we talked about earlier about the book, we said, well, one of the things that's happening right now in the real estate industry is they don't know how good we are. Mm. They don't know how well we get the agent game in the business and real estate's all about the agents. And so we said, let's write the book that shows them how much we know about how a real estate agent can truly take their real estate practice and make it a business. And that's how you get the message out. So, so you have, you have business owners listening to this, entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs who, um, like I related to a lot of the things you said, you know, I think as a visionary, often you get like speed of implementation, you get ideas, you want to push them, you want to go, you want to go, right? I mean, that's, it's the blessing and the curse of that, you know. Well, here's what I call it. Here's what I call it. It's the balance, Chaz, between urgency and persistence. Yes. Which really is also the balance between urgency and patience. In other words, you're urgent about getting things done and patient about the results. Yes. Right. Because the results will come when they come. But you never give up on the urgency of getting things done today, get or done. Right? Yeah, I love that. I think people can relate to that. I, I know some of our members listening have that challenge of like, they're, it's like, I'm doing the right things, I'm putting in the work, it, and, they're, and they're urgent about it. It's the patient for the results to show up. So now as you look back. And here's the, let me yeah. just say, here's the science of that though. There's a science. Yeah. Okay, because as you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist. Yes, I love I'm it. I'm a math and physics undergraduate. I always have loved science. Right. And I love to think more rationally and analytically along with the marketing pizzazz. Here's the thing. There's a power curve. Think about uh, a, a 747 taking off, right? Mm, and so yes. there it is on the end of the runway, and they just give all the power. And they talk about urgency. There is just all the power being put out that way. And, uh, and the thrust being thrown out the back is amazing, but the plane is barely moving. And then it's kind of there. And then it's sort of there. And halfway down the runway, it's only moving 50 miles an hour, right? And it's got a takeoff speed of 180 miles an hour. And then it then the speed picks up, speed picks up. And pretty soon you see it get a little light and then it lifts. And then sometimes those planes look like they're going straight up in the air. Yeah. And that's the power curve of a business. Sometimes you will put so much front end work into it and not feel like you're getting the results you want. And the thing is, if you know you're doing the right things, just keep it, just keep that up. You're building momentum on the runway. And when this baby takes off, you're going to be amazed at how it climbs. Yeah. And it's, you don't have to put that timetable on yourself. I think too often we compare a similar business or a similar person or industry or whatever. And we're like, well, they did it in seven years. Why am I not do? I'm at, you know, seven and I should be well, hitting the same. The other thing is just like a lot of comparisons you do with somebody else's outside versus your own inside. Yeah. Is their, their stories are exaggerated too. They were not overnight successes. Right. I can tell you, Apple was not an overnight success. It almost went out of business. Mm. USA Today wasn't an automatic success. They lost money for four or five years and it was hard getting people to implement the idea of a national newspaper. Who needs a national newspaper, right? Mm. They had to find the same with Bezos. I mean, here he is, you know, selling CDs and books, but I mean, so what? You know, that's not looking like a very big deal. And now it's the everything store and the dominant retailer. And you go, wow, when did that happen? Well, check the growth curve. It'll look like a plane taking off. Yeah, I love that. So uh, I got, again, guys, Dave Jenks here on the Connect Share Prosper episode. Let's kind of, we're going to kind of wrap it with, with this one thing. If you... Uh, this is something I, I often ask people if you could go back and not not a regret thing it's not a regret but if you could go back and change something or improve something about your career business something you could learn that you didn't like what would one thing be like 
you know, everyone kind of, as they go through a business, like I always think of things I could do differently when I started Master Networks. Like what could I, what could I have done faster or failed at that faster to learn the lesson faster or something like that? What's one thing, if you look at that, you would say, and I wish I'd, I could do that. If I were to go back, I would do that different. I think I would have given myself more permission to ask for what I want mm. and to take care of my own desires. A lot of times what I did, and of course it built my career, I became known as a guy who was trustworthy and service oriented and got the job done, whatever the job was. So that's good. I'm not trying to take that away. But I think a lot of times I was so focused on helping the venture gain its thing that I didn't always take care of myself. Sometimes that led to kind of elongated transitions from one thing like education into business. And then when I left Century 21, before I got into Keller Williams, because I hadn't built my network of what would support me mm. in the next venture. Now, fortunately, thank the Lord, I really have gotten many, a whole series, Chaz, of opportunities. But I think it's okay for business people to be very service oriented, but it's also okay to be very self oriented in the sense of getting what you want and making sure your needs are taken care of. And then, to, and then that's also a planning arm. I think I could have done a better job in my life of building my financial assets. Mm -hmm. I'm okay financially. I'm doing fine at this time of my life, but I really could have a lot bigger net worth if I'd have been more careful about how I used my money. And I guess those would be the two or three things, Chad. Was it risky? I, like, I, could, I could do better. Yeah, sure. Was it, you were not, like you said, not planful or too risky or, uh, I just think I wasn't planful enough about my own situation. Sure. In other words, that I wasn't investing money, saving and investing money the way that would have been intelligent. I had lots of business opportunities I could have used. I mean, I wrote the, I helped write the book on investing in real estate, but I only did that on a minor level and not anything major and nothing now, right? It's right, not right. like I have all these properties that have a, a net worth and are, are sending me a, a, a core of income. So sometimes I got very enamored with, and I don't mean this in a negative way, enamored with the ideas and what really works by studying other people. But then often I didn't apply those in my own life. Mm. Boy, there, that's a powerful um, lesson. And you actually had one more. I, now I got kind of caught on this one. So that's a sure, really sure. powerful. Well, I think, uh, let me go back to the first one. The first one was, sure. I think as service-based people, we want to give. And yes. so so I actually said this this morning to our team, like there's this dichotomy of like uh, being customer centric and also taking care of yourself and your business. Yes. And I think as entrepreneurs, we often struggle with that. Like, well, I have to, I have to be available 24 seven for my customer. I have to, right. I have to make sure my customer's always happy or I have to make sure my customer's this or that at the expense of ourself. And then you're saying like, Hey, I wish I'd actually taken care of that more. Well, I think also what I find about really good entrepreneurs have been around, they're tough about money. I mean, yes. they're very tough. It doesn't mean they're greedy. They're just tough about money. Yeah. In other words, they insist that their businesses are going to be profitable. That's a, that's a given. It's yes. not, and they know that to be profitable, they have to provide a great service, but that, that doesn't mean on the back end, they don't care about the profitability. They really do. And yeah. they take care of it, right? They yeah, protect yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they actually get emotional uh, in the sense of a uh, kind of angry, when things aren't working the way that they should financially. Yes. So I think being tough with a dollar is important. Yeah, it's great. Dave, great wisdom. And we could probably do this for hours. I know I could. Uh, we have. Yeah. In the past, we have. We have. We? we sure have. We've spent hours and hours. And so one last thing I just say, so guys, uh, you know, come to Connect. Dave will be one of our speakers at Connect. If you're uh, registered for Connect, you're going to love to connect with Dave, uh, you know, Dave, I've always found you to be one of the most um, approachable uh, and down-to-earth uh, mentors, leaders that I've ever met. So I always found that to be fascinating with you. Um, I've gotten to know you over the years where we've worked on other projects, books. Now we're working on a book um, together. At some point, we'll get it done. Uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're both busy, way, busy men. I just want to say about Connect because I'm going to, my session is on thinking like an entrepreneur. And what I've really realized, Chaz, yeah. and I have done two or three seminars recently called Light My Fire, The mm. Power of Self-Motivation. And the thing that it's important for entrepreneurs to understand is their most important game is their inner game. It's the inner game of self-encouragement. It's the inner game of self-direction. It's the inner game of being your own best friend. 
it's the inner game of 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 really working on your attitude yeah uh, the way you think about things and and the way you keep yourself motivated during times of doubt and discouragement right i think that if i if anyone said dave what do you think is the most powerful lesson you've learned in your life that's been it how to manage my attitude and my energy and my optimism in all weather conditions ah oh. I mean, that's that's the key in all the conditions. I remember um, all the conditions, right? It's, it's a I think sometimes we have to go through the hard lesson to learn, right? We're going to. Yeah, that's it's, the game. We're going to go through hard lessons. There is no entrepreneur at a high level of success I've ever known that didn't go through their valley of the shadow. And what's funny is so many of them like, you know, the question often gets asked if you knew then what you know now what you'd have to go through would you have done it again I think most people would say the answer is yes because of the growth and yes, the lesson they would. yes they would yeah, yeah like uh, that's such a key key point um, I remember being in real estate my very first transaction the very first one I was young I was uh, 22 I didn't even own a home myself so the very first home I sold was a triplex to a couple and I had the great wisdom of working with a real estate agent a couple who'd been around for 15 20 years so this right. wasn't their first right. And the, the day of closing, my buyer was buying the triplex, decided they wanted to back away. They're freaking out. You know, big purchase triplex. They're wow. going to live in one wow. unit, rent the other. And I'm, I'm in a massive panic. Like, you know. know, this can't happen. And I walked into their office. I'll never forget this wisdom. I walked in their office. I said, it's not happening. It's not going to close, you know. And I remember he kind of was writing on it. And he looked up and he said, are, are they here? And I said, yeah, they're downstairs. They're not, they're not signing. They're not closing. He said, do you mind if I go chat with them for a minute? And I said, sure. Calm as could be, gets up. We go downstairs to the, the closing room down there and he sits down. He says, so tell me what's going on. And they kind of vent their frustration, their concerns. He said, well, I could understand that. I could see why, you know, buying the first home is a big, big thing. And he walks us through and, you know, by 30 minutes later, they're like excited to buy their house. They're ready to go. And I'm like, wow, what a lesson I learned so quickly of like, don't panic. Don't freak out. Don't panic. You we know, always say be the calmest person in the transaction. Yeah. And, and you work at that. You work at that. Yeah. You work at being the calmest person. I mean, that was one of the things about if anyone who saw Free Solo, you know, the climbing. Oh, I just watched uh, that. I just watched uh, it uh, yesterday. Uh, if you saw that with Alex Honnold, and the thing is, you know, for him, it's all calmness. It's like it doesn't matter that every move he makes is, you know, he could lose his life. Yeah. It's not even on his mind. It's on his, his focus is on the task and what needs to be done and all the practice that he's done and all the preparation he's done. But he just learns to take those emotions and just take them out of the equation and stay oh, calm. That was so powerful. I saw it yesterday on the flight yeah. flight back. What a great movie. Wow. Dave, again, always appreciate you, your wisdom, the the experiences you share. Um, guys, listen, when you when you jump on Connect Share Prosper, our, our mission each week is to bring you successful business leaders, entrepreneurs who have learned how to connect with others. They share their wisdom. Uh, they've prospered and grown in ideas and business success. And I'll bring them to you each week. So make sure you plug in, subscribe to our Facebook, YouTube, so that when we go live, when we update a new one, you get notified right away. And for those of you coming to connect, we can't wait to see you. Dave will be there sharing how to light your fire. So again, thank you everyone for tuning in. Dave, again, thanks you for being on the show. Thank you, Chase. Thank you.